Hi, I'm Bronwyn Williams and we're back with The Small Print and today I'm going to be interviewing Gwen Gwenya from the DA's Head of Policy. And we're talking about the rather contentious issue of what immigration is and what it should be for countries, specifically countries like South Africa. So obviously immigration is a contentious issue because how we control our borders and who's allowed in and out of our safe spaces or the social contracts that we've developed obviously does have vast implications implications for the people that live within those borders and people have very extreme opinions about this across the political spectrum it's often an issue that people don't want to talk about it's one of those sort of taboo subjects like race and gender for example that tend to always raise a few eyebrows so we really wanted to discuss what the pros and cons of having borders at all are and what we should be looking at from a development point of view from a growth point of view from a progress point of view when it comes to immigration policy for South Africa in particular and for the world at large. So I want to hand over to Gwen now just to maybe give a couple of introductions as to who you are and what your current role is with the DA and then maybe we can start talking about what your perspective is on the issues facing our country and the world when it comes to immigration itself. Right. Um, I'm presently the um, head of policy for the DA, although I must say that today's discussion is entirely um, my own thoughts um, on the on the subject. Um, it's just really an area that I think I've always been quite interested in and that from a, just a policy perspective, um, I've been quite passionate about. But broadly, I have a background in um, economics um, and I actually started off my career as an economics researcher in India covering the pharmaceutical, cement and airline industry, so essentially quite a broad economic analyst. Um, and thereafter, I worked for Bloomberg, um, not on the news and journalism side, which I think is what most people are familiar with, but I worked uh, on the analyst desk for Bloomberg. Um, and then I came back to South Africa not too long ago, I think it was 2016 now, where I worked for the um, Institute of Race Relations as the COO, and then went to Parliament and now Head of Policy for the, for the DA. Just a little bit about my background. Um, and I mean, on this topic, it's so, it's so broad, um, one even, you know, it's, it's difficult to know where to, uh, where to start. But I think what is interesting to note is that South Africa at the moment is actually at a, um, you know, at a, at a point where we are reviewing our immigration um, legislation. So the current re regulatory and legislative environment around immigration policy is based on a 1999 um, framework. And obviously that's now quite outdated. It's not the most responsive to the um, current global uh, context and also how South Africa might want to strategically position itself as a as a global player. And so what's happening right now is there is actually a white paper that was drafted in 2017. And that provides, um, as white papers do, a kind of policy perspective um, and takes a comprehensive review of the overall immigration landscape. And that is the policy framework or direction that will inform then the legislation that we are expecting quite soon. I think it was, we're expecting an amendment bill in 2020 last year, but I imagine with the COVID pandemic and the various disruptions that um, caused the parliamentary schedule, um, perhaps it's, it's something that's coming now this year. So uh, it's actually an exciting time to be talking about immigration policy because it is a time of review in South Africa after effectively 18 years since this kind of review happened. Um, and some of the interesting areas of that review are, as you pointed out, um, just generally, I, I would say first and foremost, our general attitude to immigration. Um, you know, do we view it as a public policy good? Is it something that we treat as more of a threat um, to, to respond to? Um, but also how we view the role of um, of immigrants and not just those coming in, you know, um, on the continent, but broadly. Obviously, the continent is where it looks like policy is set to start with the introduction of an African passport. And I think the discussion around free movement is an interesting one. And perhaps that's where we want to start our discussion today. It's just, you know, what would this mean um, for South Africa, for the world? Um, and I think it's a, it's a concept that's not always well understood, I think. So I think it's, um, it's, it's interesting to talk about. And I think it's often confused with an idea of a borderless world, which is not quite I, how quite I envision what free movement would look like and would play out um, in reality, but certainly would lead to a world where people can move a great deal more freely, 
and also where they aren't constrained by their circumstances of birth, where they choose to seek out opportunity and, and make a living. So I think we're at a really exciting point and um, I think uh, you know, discussing free movement of people is a good place to start. Yeah, I think that is a good point, but I suppose I want to take one step back there and then talk okay. also that we can't really have a conversation about immigration without also talking about immigration, because of course we're talking about porous borders here and flows of people. And I think for the South African context, we have to sort of frame these conversations in what's happened to our tax base over the last four years and the fact that we have lost something like 55-ish 50, percent, looking at the various different data sources, of the number of individuals who are actually falling within our tax brackets and how that is perhaps something that we need to keep in the backs of our minds when we start talking about who we're letting in. It's also a case of why or what policies we're making to let people out as well. Because that's, of course, the goal at the end of that is to build a more progressive, a more inclusive and a more prosperous nation at the end of the day. And if we are talking about mm -hmm. immigration only in terms of sort of one way flows as to people coming into the country, we're perhaps not looking at everything that's going on. So I suppose that the policy question is not just how lenient we are about letting people into our countries, it's also how lenient we are about letting people out and also what incentives we have on both sides and who are the people that we are targeting there. Is this a question of only really talking about letting richer people out and letting poorer people in or is there a way that we can sort of level that playing field? I suppose from the research that I've done with Flux Trends, looking at what's happening with immigration flows is that it does look like we are actually attracting wealthier people as well as poorer people to South Africa from the African continent. But at the same time, we're still losing more wealthier people to the rest of the world in general. So I don't know if you have a view on that sort of big picture, on those big picture trends that are taking place in terms of both ins and outs through the borders that we have. Yes, so I think that's a good point that we probably more accurately should just be talking about migration policy um, overall, which would include, you know, immigration and, 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 and immigration as well. And I think what's interesting is that in the past, um, immigration, that is the Africans leaving our borders to go settle elsewhere, hasn't really uh, formed a strategic focus in South Africa's policy framework, but that's very much now on the agenda. But I'm concerned that not always necessarily in um, perhaps in what I think might hold potential for more nefarious ways, you know. So I think sometimes the conversation steers towards how can we extract value from those South Africans that have left. And I'm not quite sure from the point of view of South Africans who are immigrating whether that's a very exciting proposition. Um, but I think obviously we have to be mindful of South Africans that are leaving. Um, and I suppose that is in the nature of countries to look at it from the perspective of, well, even if they've left our borders, how can we ensure that they continue to bring value? Um, and so that does usually center around conversations around taxation, around making it easier for um, expats to, um, you know, to bring money back into the economy through remittances. Um, there are softer or more benevolent um, indications where they say they would like to register South Africans who have left um, and have immigrated and to have a national database of South Africans living abroad for the purposes of perhaps, you know, protecting them against any potential security threats where they might be abroad. But I'm not so convinced that a national database of South Africans abroad <laughs> would be used to protect South African interests abroad. I think they're far more likely to be used as a way of tracking um, potential sources of revenue abroad and how we can perhaps tax the Africans who are abroad or um, I don't know, I feel like in means that are more geared towards raising revenue for the country than necessarily improving the lives of those who have immigrated. But certainly the conversation um, is multi-directional um, it's not just about those coming into the country. And an important point to say about uh, migration flows as well is really the point that the harder you actually make it for people to come in, the harder it is um, or the less likely they are to leave. And I think this idea of conceiving of migration as being about flows as opposed to unilateral movements in one direction is so important for the broader acceptance of, of, of migration because I think part of the fear is, is, um, is of rising populations, people who uh, come in and might dramatically change way of life and however founded those concerns may be, they often link to the idea of permanent residence. Whereas to a large extent, and we especially see it here in South Africa, many people come in with the intention to go out. They're either here for temporary trade or to visit or for tourism, etc. And I think the more we can encourage flows by making it easier for people to enter, 
and and actually are ironically or quite linked, making it easier then for them to leave. It's precisely the right way to be thinking about it. But when it's very difficult for people to enter a country, then they tend to overstay and they tend to not leave because precisely if you know you're not going to be able to come in easily again, when you get in, you kind of see it as, oh, wow, that was my last opportunity or that was a, a rare opportunity for me to be able to enter the country. Um, and there's a high incentive not to leave precisely because the risk of not being able to re-enter is so high. But when we have much more transparent rules and processes around people being able to enter for temporary stays, either for brief periods of work or to visit relatives, whatever the case may be, it's far less likely that you create one directional movement and you actually create a process of, of, of flows in and out, which is precisely what we should be encouraging. Yeah, so to go back to your earlier point when you were talking about how we should be optimizing for more free movement, why do you think that is an important thing? It, or firstly, is that something that you would actually put your name to, to say that we should be allowing our borders to be more porous in both directions? Or would you say rather not at this point in time? Yeah, I mean, the first thing is that our borders are already porous. So in, in, in most countries, the conversation is about how to um, deal with the global scenario where um, there is a, a great degree of movement in and out in any case. So we already have relatively um, open borders. And I think the first thing is to is to talk about what free movement is and, and is not. And I think I prefer to talk about free movement because at least in the African context, um, and, and legally, it's something that's a lot more defined and less loose of a term than the idea of open borders, because the openness of borders tends to exist along a spectrum. And it's difficult to know when somebody is talking about open borders, where on the spectrum they're talking about or where their line it becomes a very difficult conversation to navigate. But um, at least in the direction that the African Union is moving in and what they mean, and I think it's a good way to think about free movement, is really in three stages. So the first stage of free movement of people um, encapsulating essentially visa-free entry or visas um, on arrival. So you make it much easier for people to travel um, in and out of borders. So they, 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 so they definitely are still borders. Um, I think that's also another important thing to note is that we're not talking about um, a global scenario where it's it's suddenly borderless and there are no no longer any sovereign borders. And maybe that is an interesting conversation to also have about a border free world, but that's certainly not inherently part of the free movement discussion. So the first thing is, you know, visa free entry or entry on arrival, so making travel easier between borders. The second component being um, right of residence. Um, so being able to temporarily or permanently reside in a particular place. And then the other element of free movement is the right of establishment. So, you know, the right to be able to, to work and to secure, um, you know, means to, to live and survive in that particular area. And so obviously the, the a scenario where you have complete freedom of movement, um, you would have guaranteed all things where there's visa free entry, people have the rights of residence and also have right of um, of establishment. And I think mostly where South Africa is, and also in terms of the African passport that's recently been in the news, and uh, we're told that it's at a stage where it's progressing quite fast and, and, and to be implemented uh, this year, we're really talking about that first level, visa-free entry, and that's what I think a lot of countries in the, in, in, in the African continent with the African passport will be able to achieve is um, this African passport being an, uh, being, um, an enabler to visa-free travel, or at the very least, um, a visa on arrival across the African continent. But we're still very far away from talking about right of establishment um, and rights of residence. And maybe quickly just to say why I think these other two elements are so important. I mean, just from a kind of principled point of view, um, you know, I, I strongly feel that perhaps you know, free movement is one of the last human rights, you know, goals, or it's it's really at the frontier of human of, of human rights right now. I think it's the only area of human rights that hasn't really gained global acceptance. I mean, of course, you know, globally we're still fighting human rights challenges across, you know, a number of fronts. So I'm not trying to say that we've achieved um fulfillment of human rights across the spectrum, but I think at least the other rights, even where they're being abused or they're not being fulfilled, at least there's recognition that this is um, a human right. Whereas I think there isn't really recognition yet um, of the right to free movement. There's still this idea 
that where you happen to arbitrarily come out of your mother's womb or, you know, wherever you manage to plonk out of the world is suddenly, you know, um, should determine your lifelong opportunities and where you belong essentially for the rest of your life. And I think this is such a bizarre idea, at least if you are a liberal or liberally inclined, I think we really need to challenge this idea that one of the most basic circumstances of birth should be essentially unalterable. And of course there are, you know, you would say you, you can travel, but it's, it's really quite hard. Most people, um, you know, it takes quite a concerted effort to be able to move to another country. And most times people are effectively locked um, into their country of birth. And so I, 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 at least from a principled perspective, think it's, a, it's such an important fight to have at a principled level. And I think once we can then agree on the principles, so I think there's firstly a principled fight or discussion to be had about is it right that where you happen to be born should um, essentially terminally determine your, your lifelong prospects. And if we can agree that it shouldn't, then I think the conversations around practicalities are secondary. And I think it's been that way for most, for most rights. I mean, I'm sure people would have said, well, there are practical hurdles to women being able to vote or, you know, to, to any kind of right. But I think those discussions come after the principle. Can we agree on the principle first? And then we can discuss how we pragmatically achieve it. I suppose then the question really is, why are people so resistant to this? Why does it get such a lot of pushback when you start talking about changing borders or removing them all together? It's, it's something that really does raise a lot of eyebrows. And I suppose some of the, the reasons for that are that people are scared that their own rights and entitlements will be eroded by others being allowed into the party. So it's almost a scarcity mindset view frame that people are coming at this from. So suppose if we are wanting to progress towards a more borderless, more porous world where we have more freedom of movement, we have to be able to articulate for people, particularly people that aren't in the most privileged strata of society, what the benefits of movement and migration and freedom of movement really are for them, not just only as being able to move themselves, but what are their benefits in terms of their place in the world when they are going to be facing increased competition, which is, I think, one of those things that you can't really avoid, particularly in a country like South Africa, where we have seen absolutely in the world around us that people are quite resistant to these ideas just based on the sort of events that have unfolded in the news over the last couple of decades. So I don't know, how, what would you say to such people that are feeling like their, their role, their status and their income or perhaps their employment would be threatened by being more relaxed when it comes to controlling who is allowed where at what times? Yeah, I mean, all of these threats I think have to be addressed you know, kind of holistically, because they all do, all of these um, groups, of, groupings of fears, if you can call them that, are are linked. So, and some of them are linked to, to certain myths that aren't necessarily the reality of what we're talking about when we talk about freedom of movement. So, I mean, the first one that I would continue to stress is that there absolutely are still borders. So, especially those who are fearful from a kind of crime um, perspective, um, to say that you still do have borders, you can have security at borders. Um, and for me, it's akin to saying, you know, an open gate. So if you have a gate that people are allowed to cross, um, you know, relatively freely, it doesn't mean the gate, A, the gate doesn't exist. So a gate that delineates um, the boundaries between, you know, one sovereign state and another. Secondly, it doesn't imply that you can't have security at the gate, um, not to, um, not there to, to, to determine who, who can and can't be allowed in, in a broad fashion, but to just make sure that obviously um, there's no criminal um, you know, activity happening, that they aren't bringing in contra contraband items, human trafficking or human smuggling. Um, I mean, that kind of, um, so to, to, to effectively, you can ensure that there is law enforcement at those borders. Um, which is different to adjudicating um, based on other criteria whether people are allowed in or not. And on the jobs front, I think it's particularly obviously a, f a fear that has to be addressed also at the skills level. I mean, I think most people who, who are skilled are excited about, you know, the prospects of what being able to work abroad might, might hold for them, the, the prospects of remote work, etc. And so obviously I think those fears tend to be tend to be expounded amongst those who feel like they will be left behind in a globalizing world where perhaps they don't have the skills to, to compete globally and they feel they need certain um, protection. So, I mean, especially if we are talking about this as a long-term policy goal, that is obviously one of the things to address, is to address pe um, 
every individual's level of competitiveness. So to make sure that people feel that this is an opportunity, not a threat, and that um, they are being given the opportunity to seek um, opportunities and advancement, not just in a confined geographic space, but the whole world is essentially, um, you know, the oyster, as they say. And I think I think that's part of it. If people don't view don't view the opening up of the world as an opportunity for them, then obviously they're, they're likely to be resistant. Um, and viewing it as an opportunity requires you to feel like you are a competitive player in that global space. And unfortunately, a lot of people um, don't feel that. But it, it is also interesting to me about the cultural, and maybe I'm getting, I'm getting myself into trouble here saying that it might be something innate or cultural, but I do think that there is, I mean, an clearly an observable tendency between some countries where people do tend to seek out opportunity elsewhere. And I don't know, I don't have all the answers about that, how that is to be addressed here in South Africa. I mean, just anecdotally, and I recognize the dangers of, you know, sort of anecdotal, um, um, you know, examples and not sort of looking at sort of hard data. But just if I can just say anecdotally, I mean, I know very few or experience very few people in South Africa who might be struggling, who think, oh, well, let me, you know, travel to another African country that has a higher growth rate and see if I can make something work there. Um, so I, I think it is also partly that where I don't feel South Africans, um, I don't feel South Africans at a significant level um, perhaps view it as an opportunity for them as well, when it absolutely should be. I mean, South Africa by no means, even if you just restrict it to the African continent, is by no means the fastest growing economy um, in Africa. So the idea that um, a more open Africa doesn't hold opportunities for uh, for us is, is just not true. And I think we need to help people to see that. Um, I just think there is a, a, high, a high degree of inertia where people don't view it as, as, as an opportunity that they can go out and take advantage of. I suppose it comes back to seeing those borders once again as two-way doors, not just a one-way street, which does seem Precisely. to be where a lot of the, the problems do come from. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the work of Glenn Wheel and his radical markets proposals. Have you read up on his radical proposal to share the benefits of immigration with people who might not be the most economically empowered in particular markets. So in that book, he had a, a rather crazy, it's definitely a controversial idea, and that he suggested that ordinary citizens, that is even poorer people and middle class people, should be able to sponsor labor, to sponsor an immigrant to come into the country on the proviso that the sponsored immigrant has to share their income with their sponsor family. So it's almost like you're able to sponsor people to come and work for your company, but instead of sponsoring an employee for your company, you're sponsoring someone like yourself, but you get to share in the benefits that they bring to your country directly. So of course, sounds there's going like to be eyebrow raising. <laughs> yeah, yeah, from, a, from like sort of owning labor perspective. <laughs> Yes, it sounds like we're treating um, immigrants as companies, so you can kind of invest in them, and if their stock price rises, you get a share as like the investor in your immigrant. I'm, I'm not sure. That sounds a little bit dubious of an yeah, idea to for, me, for, a I would... for a fixed amount of time. For a fixed amount of time. Yes, so maybe I would have to. I would have to. I mean, that's interesting. Look up, look into it a little bit more. But on that Im immigrants, because I think I would, I would think part of where that kind of idea comes from is again trying to find an answer to people who see immigrants as largely ex extractive, you know, so they come in, they might, you know, they compete with locals for their jobs. Um, also, they might be sending money back home. So there's also a fear that the money they do make doesn't exactly add value to the economy of where they work. So it sounds like that kind of proposal is trying to address um, concerns of the receiving country about the benefits that immigrants and making sure that immigrants bring value to that country. But I think there are a number of, um, you know, policy proposals or interventions that might speak to that. So, I mean, A for me, it's so, you know, if you have a more transparent and efficient um, immigration process where a lot which South Africa doesn't, where um, it's easy, you make it easy for people to have legal status in the first place. So, I mean, there's a lot of conversations in South Africa about undocumented migrants and illegal persons. Um, and I, I'm not really, you know, one who tends towards PC language, but I, I do think that it is important to recognize the person themselves is not illegal, but their status might be not compliant with the laws, their status is illegal, but, and the reasons that give rise to that illegal status, 
comes from the government administration itself. So if you've got officials that can be bribed, who demand bribes for processing documents, where the system loses your documents, where a whole variety of things can happen at the stage of trying to become legal or trying to acquire legal status, then the system itself gives rise to high numbers of of people who are undocumented and don't have legal status. But if you can increase and have a better system where it's transparent and you know everyone um, and, and that system is fair and there's no corruption, then I think you encourage legality. So you'll have greater numbers of people who are in the country legally. And that obviously encourages their integration into um, legal processes. Um, I know before when I was at the IR, there was the study that was conducted and, um, you know, on the contribution that migrants make to the economy. And there was a lot of, and I think it has its place, um, that kind of anecdotal field work, actually talking to, um, to migrant workers themselves. And I just remember that a lot of the feedback received of many people who, who wanted to, to pay taxes and to be integrated, but for many of them, very legitimate reasons, you know, have been applying for 12 years, don't, you know, the department loses their documentation, they have bribed or paid, you know, exorbitant amounts and bribes and trying to um, pay off officials for actually processing pretty standard documents, um, but require bribes to facilitate the process. And then still after that, actually not receiving any documentation or not being able to um, acquire legal status. But the point is, if you allow immigrants who are working here, who do run a business and make it easier for them to have legal status and to pay taxes, certainly that's a much more achievable and I think less eyebrow raising way of making sure that if they do work here, they are contributing to taxes like any other working South African um, who, who pays taxes. So that's the first thing. I think um, legality and getting status, um, status of systems working is the first step to making sure that those who are working in South Africa are able to actually contribute to taxes. The second thing, interestingly enough for me, is, is always the view that, you know, South Africans don't want to pay for, for immigrants. So, you know, South African taxpayers' money must go to South Africans and it mustn't go to immigrants. Again, this is not something that I can really fully relate to. I mean, if I pay taxes, I don't actually quite care who they go to. I mean, I don't care if my taxes go to help, you know, a struggling woman from Zimbabwe or whether it goes to an unemployed South African. I mean, it's just another person who's struggling. So, so, so firstly, from that perspective, I don't really get the idea of South African taxpayers going to South African, to struggling South Africans. But even if we take that view that each nationality's taxpayers must only finance their own um, citizens um, um, who are struggling, then I think we should do an audit of how many international um, you know, immigrants we have working in the country and then say, well, there are X many um, immigrants um, or foreigners who work, or foreigners rather, who work in the country. So therefore X amount is available to support um, the social welfare of foreigners in the country. Because if you take that view that you, you only your own nationality's tax money can go towards those who are struggling, then it's interesting that we haven't attempted to quantify how many foreigners are living in South Africa, how much tax they contribute, and therefore the amount of tax due to other foreigners in the country who might be struggling. So those are all ways that for me are still a little bit more perhaps acceptable than um, you know, literally investing in, um, in someone and asking them to pay their share to you. So I think there are ways of, of getting around that, that fear. Yeah, I'd have to agree, but I suppose the, the real subtext to what you're saying there is that the challenge is not that immigrants aren't contributing to society. The challenge is really a bit deeper at a more systemic level when you start talking about the formalization of our economy altogether, where perhaps that sort of social contract is breaking down is where the, in, where the economy has been forced to be functioning in an informal level rather than at a formal level. So it comes back again to perhaps the either the regulatory hurdles are too high to get people legally working as employees or to start businesses legally in our country. So I suppose the question then really becomes how do we make sure that we can attract more businesses and more individuals at a legal basis in a regulatory framework that is actually an incentive to getting people to come and invest here, whether that's with their labor, their time or by starting a venture, rather than perhaps trying to stop people from coming in in the first place. So for me, I think that's whole sort of formalization of a whole lot of those parts of the economy 
could be an easier way to get win-wins for people that both want to come and work here and for people that live in the economy. Because of course, once any business is formalized, part of the legal structure then it is already contributing to society on many levels either from just creating employment or from starting to actually contribute to the fiscus too which is something we desperately need at the moment based on our current budget speech so perhaps you can talk us through some of the the regulations that are either lacking or are existing that need to be removed in order to make south africa a more attractive destination for investment or for immigration for individuals and for organizations that could actually be used to deepen our markets yeah sure so this is quite a broad area i mean the uh, one of the important things i think is also how we conceptualize south africa's attractiveness right and i think a lot of the language around scarce skills is often that we need to make it easier for people to come here so um i think i spoke about this or I don't know, in a tweet recently on social media where I, I think that, you know, the, the idea seems to be that there are these hordes of immigrants outside South Africa's borders who have skills and who are just dying to work in the country. And all we do is like just lower down, lower down the drawbridge so these people can come in. So it's about making it easy for them to enter. Whereas the reality is we can lower down the drawbridge, but there's just nobody there standing and waiting to get in who is even remotely skilled, I don't think. Um, look, there, there are obviously, as you say, are people who have money who still come to South Africa, but I don't think it's because they are, in the, for the most part, working professionals who see South Africa as having a thriving economy that they can um, establish a successful career in. I think we might be attracting people who've already made their money. Lots of people might be coming back due to family ties. But I'd be quite curious to um, to learn that there are hordes of people who view South Africa as an attractive economic environment, um, as a place where they can invest their skills and that's why they're here. I think there are other probably poor factors driving those who do come into the country. So for most people, we first actually have to work at the attracting skills part. And as I say, our idea of attracting skills often comes down to just making it easier. So just lowering the drawbridge, you know, we need to make processes simpler. So people talk about, you know, e-visas and allowing spouses to also be able to work and reside here. And all of that is, is all very nice. Obviously, we must make it as easy as possible. I agree with that. But attracting skills applies something a lot more proactive, not just the passive relaxation of regulations. So we do need to have a strategy of how we plan to recruit and actually attract people into the country, which I think that we um, that we lack. Um, but then also when it comes to attracting people, I mean, just lastly this week, the draft critical skills um, list was was drawn up and released. And aside from all the other um, you know, critiques that have been made on it, that it's a much shorter list than previous years. And, you know, and as usual, people question the methodology of how such a skills list gets drawn up in the first place. But I think we have to start even almost a step before that. And I think there is a, you know, part of Part of um, drawing up a critical skills list in the first place is for me a kind of command and control view of the economy that it is even possible for a government to imagine what jobs there will be in the future, what gaps the market um, people need to need to fill, what potential future innovations they could be, and that we can draw up a list of the kinds of people that are necessary. Whereas the reality is we don't know who might contribute something and, and, and who might not. And also obviously then the often the the blurring of distinction between a skill and a job if you look at the critical skills list actually most of those things they are, are perhaps scarce jobs jobs that maybe people are struggling to fill so it might say for example i'm, I'm not saying this is on the list just as an example it might say teacher but i mean teacher I don't think teacher is the skill, the teacher is the is the job and certain skills are required to be able to do that job. So I'm not even sure we, we're quite accurate in, in saying these are the skills the country needs. We're actually putting job titles that maybe the country needs. Um so so I mean I've I've got I've got concerns around how we identify the kinds of people that we need in the first place and um, I have a lot more faith, I suppose, in this particular area in, in the market and that we should um, actually just have a much more liberal um, um, regime where I think there is talk about moving towards a point 
a points-based system, but obviously I just think that it's hard to plan for the kinds of people that are going to make a contribution. So bar anyone being a criminal, et cetera, we should allow in as many people as possible. Um, and I mean, I don't want to move on to that tangent of social welfare, but I know often the concern is that, well, we can't afford so many people, but social welfare and bring, allowing people entry and, and residence are certainly, again, not inherently linked policy offers. You can say people can, can, can travel and can look for work without guaranteeing them any kind of social support whatsoever. So I find the the mixture of the social welfare conversation with the immigration conversation very confusing because those two are not necessarily don't come as a joint package whatsoever so if you can survive here you're welcome if you can't sorry we can't support you i mean that's also a possible uh, policy stance um, to take but i think you know ricardo hausman um speaks of this idea about know-how you know and i think that's an important element that we're missing from our idea of how to attract skills is that we think of skills as being like qualifications. So we're going to try and attract people with certain qualifications or who hold particular job titles. Whereas there's also a great degree of intangible, intangibleness to the value that people can bring. And not all knowledge and skill is in qualifications or in the job titles that people hold. Um, and there are, and you know, also referred to as kind of just like tacit knowledge, you know. Um, why do some communities or people seem to thrive at being good business people? You know, why have immigrant communities in South Africa been so successful in these kind of spuzzer shops and, um, you know, these small businesses they've created? Because they've, I think, put together communities or networks um, that, that, that have helped this particular business model of theirs uh, be successful. It's not to say that that can't be transferred. I'm just saying it's less tangible to codify those things in a law that says these are the skills that we need. Um, you know, these people just have knowledge that resides in their heads, in their particular networks, um, and it's tacit knowledge. It's not um, in the form of a, a qualification. And that goes for any successful businessmen that they are who don't have a qualification. You know, how do you bottle entrepreneurship? How do you say, because we do want to attract people who are entrepreneurs, who, who, who have that kind of mindset. And, that, and yet that's not something that easily is put in a skills list. Um, because it's not a qualification and I don't think you can say your job title unless you already own a business as an entrepreneur. So um, I think that's the problem with it. And you know what Hausman says is that what you actually need for, for growing economies and what thriving economies seem to have been able to do is get networks of people with, with, with know-how. Um, and he uses this fantastic um, analogy um, where he talks about know-how being like almost letters if you're playing a game of Scrabble, where know-how is a letter and the products and services that exist in, a, in an economy being the words. So to make a word or a product or a service, you need people with different skills, in other words, the different letters. And Often the letters come together to form new words and words you wouldn't have thought of. And it goes back to this idea of how difficult it is for governments or any kind of central agency to be able to plan ahead and say, these are all the words that can ever be made or that we know can be made, um, or in other words, products or services. And therefore, these are the letters or skills that we need or, or know how that we need. And I don't think anyone can do that. Um, what you want to do is attract as many types of skills and people with different um, know-how together and those people interact in ways that are unexpected and that you can't necessarily predict to develop new products new ways of doing things and so you just want to create a melting pot of talent essentially um, and it's difficult to say you know for our needs we need an engineer and a you know whatever to come together you might need different types of know-how to come together to create that thing and so um, for me, that's why I think it's just it's just better to have as, liber as liberal um, an immigration or visa regime as possible and not to be so specific about what jobs and what skills your economy needs, because I think it's very difficult for any agency to, to plan ahead and to do that. Well, I suppose that that's kind of touching on perhaps the biggest elephant in this particular room, which is the fact that essentially 
our country, like all countries, has really three different immigration policies. You've got the immigration policy for the really rich who essentially don't have one. You've got a couple of million dollars in your pocket. You can essentially live anywhere you like without any questions being asked. And then you've got the sort of second tier for skilled workers who are still a tiny minority of the world's population. And at the same time, then you've got that sort of third tier, which is your unskilled migrants. And these are the people that are the most desperate to move sometimes for very, very dire circumstances, but they also have the most incentive to go and try something else. And I suppose that becomes then a question of ethics, particularly in a country like ours, which is already so unequal. Why are we tolerant of different policies for different essentially social classes? It's not a nice thing to say, but that's essentially in reality, that is the way immigration policy has been shaped. And it definitely surprises me that we are tolerant of that, that we are tolerant of having actual different privileges for people of different degrees of wealth. And I think in the African context, that question should be asked perhaps more often as to why we are wanting to entrench different treatment for different status levels in society. I think that goes back to the idea of thinking that we know beforehand the type of person that's going to add value and the type of person that, that isn't. And one of the simplest ways is just has been in the past to say, well, if you have a certain amount of money or if you have a certain qualification, we are quite sure that you're going to add value. And if you have no qualifications and, and no money, then we're pretty sure you're not going to be able to add any value. So I think it's always been approached from that perspective. And I think what I was trying to point out is just the shortcomings of that particular approach, how it's difficult to codify all types of skills and, and levels of know-how that people can bring. Um, and then on the, on the investor or capital side, those who are able to essentially buy their freedom of movement, um, you know, you exclude many who might equally have entrepreneurial potential and have great ideas, but haven't yet been able to, you know, choose the context of where they live to implement that. And I think in South Africa, the threshold for a business visa is 5 million rand, which, you know, if you are starting, a, wanting to start a small business and have a business idea and think that you might have a shot in making it a success in South Africa, but not in the war-torn or, you know, um, um, failed state that you might come from, and you think that there's an opportunity to try out your idea in South Africa, you can't do that unless you've got um, above 5 million rand, which cuts out a lot of small business um, ideas and opportunities. So I think, you know, precisely for, for that reason, there needs to be a rethink. I mean, not only just from a moral or ethical or principled perspective, which I think is what you're kind of more alluding to is how can we have this kind of class differentiated approach to freedom of movement. But I think even if we are to be cold and, um, you know, look at it from a bottom line perspective, I think we are losing out potentially on many great entrepreneurs, ideas, etc., because we we have this um, this threshold that essentially won't permit for, for smaller businesses to have entry. And again, as I say, as long as somebody will not require social support um, from the country, I don't see why not. You have a great business idea, you want to try and make it work in South Africa, and you say you'll take care of your own um, you know, basic needs. I don't see why you shouldn't be allowed to come here and 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 you know and and, and give it a shot. It seems the only barrier for most people seems to be you come, you know, I know I have this discussion often, you 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 come up continuously against the barrier of, but we can't support all of these people, we can't, but there's no inherent um, requirement to support them. Um, and if you're talking about people who might you know, access social grants and all of that. I mean, again, they've, um, there's data from the Department of Home Affairs and others looking at child grant recipients. And I think the last I looked, like less than 1% um, of those recipients are foreign nationals. And um, so I think, and also it goes the same for housing. So many of the housing opportunity um, tiers, whether you're looking at social assistance or you're looking at um, RDP or BNG housing, um, the different layers of, of housing opportunities available, most of the time the requirement is to be a South African citizen or to have South African permanent residency. So the opportunities for foreigners having entry to social welfare um, are really, really minimal. I think some of the bigger challenges have come on the healthcare side, where obviously doctors just feel from a professional earth point of view, 
um, you know, mm. you, you can, and also for constitutionally, you cannot deny emergency care to anyone. So I think that's one area with, and that's not usually even the area that most people talk about, but that is probably the area that is more prone to, um, to, to strain because of their requirement not to turn away, you know, emergency care to anyone who presents themselves requiring emergency care. But on those other elements, there shouldn't be much concern. Even on the healthcare side, there are other countries that have had to grapple with this. So even in the UK, if you're going to go there as an immigrant worker, you're required to sort of pay up front your share of national health insurance or whatever that case may be. So there's definitely solutions, as you're saying, this is not something yes. that you should see it as being a roadblock. It's rather a problem or a challenge and then how we can actually frame it. So I suppose the next thing I really want to talk about was the, the kind of dichotomy that's going on. And it's kind of a global issue, but I suppose it's more prescient here in South Africa with what's going on. With on the one hand, Africa is trying to open up. We've got the African passports and the African Union making tr lots of moves on both the trade front and the immigration front to try and make Africa a more open place. But at the same time, we're starting to see movements uh, and movements towards successions and rumors of successions, like the Cape Independence Movement, for example, which is actually talking about at the same time that Africa, the continent, is trying to open up. There are other voices that are saying we should actually be imposing sort of more borders and, and closing up various different communities or within our within our larger communities. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on the wisdom of that and we can probably also add in an extra sort of layer to that which is also the, the increased talk on a more global level about projects like charter cities like with the future of what's going to happen to say Hong Kong's residents and how perhaps charter cities with more lax labor, immigration, tax laws, all the rest can be used to sort of set up pockets of development within countries like ourselves or countries like Ireland. There are many, many countries that are talking about these sort of special trade, special immigration zones. But at the same time, we're talking about as soon as you have a special zone, you're essentially creating another border or another layer of distinction between the flows of movements of people that are allowed in and out of these special areas. So I don't know if you have any sort of context on that emerging dichotomy on how there are movements towards more borders and less borders almost at the same time and how you see that playing out or the wisdom of these sorts of policies yeah um i mean with the um maybe to start with the example of of charter cities and and the like i mean there are you know predictions that just within the next decade over 70 percent of south africa's population will be living in cities so i'm not too sure of you know the big difference that it might make to identify particularly urban zones where you're going to have more relaxed um, immigration policies because well that's you might as well just say the country has a relaxed you know immigration policy or a free movement policy because those are the zones where people are likely to be headed anyway so without you directing them to the cities that is precisely where they want to go. So the moment you have cities that are essentially zones of free movement and free trade, well, that's basically the country because that's where people are gravitating towards anyway. Um, so I think, I mean, maybe um, some countries see that as a way to inch towards free movement or maybe as an answer, uh, as, as an alternative, but I think it's pretty much the same thing. Um, and anything that I think for me gets us closer to a world where um, there's far greater freedom of movement, I would strongly support. Um, and that's, as I say, not a borderless world, because I think there are still advantages um, to having the idea of nation states. I mean, even city states, but you, so even if the nation falls apart, but you have a universe, you have a, a future where there's more um, city states. The, the point is there is still um, value in having um, geographic borders um, where people have a sense of belonging, where you can organize your affairs. I mean, I, I just think there are a lot of legal and, and other administrative, administrative and um, laws-based reasons so that you know when you move from one place to another, um, unless of course we could reach the scenario where the entire world is governed under the same set of laws. But I think we're so far away from that, um, that I think the value of having clearly defined borders is still going to be with us for quite a long time. But having borders doesn't necessarily have to mean that our movement between those borders is restricted. Um, it's like, you know, moving within your house, there's many doors and those doors can remain, but it's quite easy to move in and out of them. Um, but I think, uh, for me, I think it's precisely because you have a world of increasing globalization, of increasing talk about free movement. It's precisely because of that, that you then have the pushback for people wanting to have 
you know, to have stronger border, border controls to close up precisely as a reaction to the strong movements towards opening up, um, because there is always going to be that, um, that counter force. And I think the challenge is, as with, it sounds almost trite, but to try and take everyone along. I mean, so far, one can understand that globalization hasn't been a tide that has lifted all. Um, and so I think answering making sure that the solution is in figuring out ways in which more and more people see it as a way that can benefit them is um, certainly the key. Um, and I think allowing, you know, it's just, I don't know how we can get more people to travel and to move, but I think the more people have had an entirely parochial existence, so they grew up in one place, they've lived in one place their whole lives, the idea of the outside world is so scary, whether going to the outside world or receiving anything from the outside world, including its people, seems very scary. Um, but I think the more that people um, travel and our experience and, and sorry, get experiences in different um, in different areas. So the more that they feel that they're part of this global movement of people. So it's not other people moving. They're also one of those moving people. Um, and so getting people to move a lot more, I think, is something that we should be continuously thinking of so that people can view themselves as global citizens. Um, and that's something to be encouraged. Um, and just and to just touch on briefly on South Africa's own sort of burgeoning, I don't know, um, you know, independence movement or that idea of um, Cape independence. I think it is being, well, no, may, maybe not precisely to the Cape independence. I don't, I don't want to paint them with ideas that perhaps um, they don't necessarily buy into, but those who might be for um, more, more restrictive borders, et cetera, I think often have, going back to what we discussed in the beginning, inaccurate ideas of what open borders might mean. So they often fear again, um, A, um, crime, you know, and think that we're going to be living in a kind of state of anarchy where there are no borders and it's just a free for all. And that's not the case at all. In fact, I strongly believe that um, secure borders encourages freedom of movement. Um, they're not things to be looked at as competing ends. So the discussion of free movement must be linked to the discussion of of, of secure borders. And if your borders are secure, the more you can encourage free movement because it means that you can make sure that you can keep criminal elements out, that your borders, um, the free movement doesn't become a way to facilitate, um, you know, human trafficking and other sorts of, of criminal activity. So you actually need, and you need, you know, better biometric data, you need to move, I think South Africa's doing this, um, or there's talk about doing this, moving away from this kind of immigration or visa system that's very much based on nationality, where we say, oh, anyone from this country is automatically, um, you know, a desirable, and anyone from this country is undesirable, to rather more systems based on individual risk profiles and collection of biometric data, and making sure that we assess um, people's risk at an individual level. I know the data and privacy people are going to come in with a whole lot of, I'm sure there's, um, you know, a whole lot of concerns about that, and uh, that we, you could go into a world where perhaps everywhere you go, you're being tracked by facial recognition and it's linked to some global profile where everyone has a global profile of your activities around the world, I'm sure. Yeah, so that bring, it does bring in scary elements as well. I'm not going to, to deny, but I think moving in that direction allows us to have a much more individual based system to, um, to, to, to movement, as opposed to this national based one, which paints everyone from a particular country uh, with the same brush. So I think if we can address all the myths and, and illegitimate fears linked with free movement of people, and we can recognize that it means free movement actually, you know, promotes secure borders, um, et cetera, and that it's actually um, a good thing. I mean, one thing we haven't touched on is like, obviously the cultural element, the fear that people are bringing in a culture that's different to ours or values that are different to ours. Yeah, I suppose that that is the one thing. And the other thing we haven't really spoken about is how, of course, freedom of movement is one thing, but freedom of movement of money is, a, is another thing, particularly in more sort of constrained economic times. I suppose the risk is if you stop allowing physical bodies to move easily across countries, you increase the incentive for people to start using borderless digital currencies, for example, which makes it all the more harder to fund the various different elements of your social contracts. And I'm sure any question that relates to movement of people is going to increasingly have to start asking those questions as to how to make sure the money stays within your borders if that's what you want to have, 
Well, the alternative, of course, is to move towards an entirely borderless world, which, as you say, does come with its own sort of privacy challenges and different challenges in terms of things like property rights and protections of peoples and bodies and goods within borders. So I'm not sure if you have a view on that. I'm not sure if you have a view as to whether our South African policies are conductive to allowing cash to grow within our borders or if they have become perhaps a bit too porous in that regard or maybe even just not looking at the risks of what could happen in terms of free movements of money even as free movements of people are still not necessarily very established. Yeah, I mean, I think essentially, I mean, like with any, you know, we're talking about, you know, flows. If you make it hard for, for money to go out or to come in, then you're going to trap money in one location or another. And the same with people. So I think, you know, if it's difficult to, to enter the country, when people do enter, they're less likely to leave if this is the country that they head towards because, well, they might not be able to enter again. And so I think, Part of the key as well to, to not being concerned about um, money flowing out of the country is to almost, you know, it sounds paradoxical, I think, but to make it easy for, for money to flow out of the country, because if, if money, if, if it's very difficult for you to get money out of the country, the thing you desperately want to do is get it out of the country and find any means to do so. But if you know investing in the country, bringing money here is not going to be an absolute nightmare for you to, to move out when you, when you need to. Um, then I think you actually are going to attract more more money into the country. So, I mean, that is kind of just at a simplistic level what the conversation about relaxing our exchange controls, I think, um, really is focused on is that, you know, if you make it easy to, um, to take money out, ironically, uh, more money will come in, which, you know, I think almost it might sound paradoxical, but I think it's, it's also quite intuitive that people are not going to bring money in if they can't take it out um, when they need to. Um, but also, I think we need to look at the fact that many people might be going abroad to pursue work opportunities and um, look at the, the potential for um, for remittances as well to to drive local economies. And I think South Africa has been one of those countries that doesn't really focus very much on remittances. But in some countries, they're a huge part of um, of the of the local economy. Um, so I think there's definitely potential. In, in, um, in losing people with skills, um, if they still are bringing money back home and they still see it as a home. So I think that that's probably part of the part of the push of making sure this strategy for immigration, which traditionally has been missing from South Africa's um, migration policy approach. Um, and I think, if, you know, to try and retain some form of connection or contact with people who move abroad, certainly that helps if they still have family here, because that means they will be an incentive for them to come back to visit um, as tourists, to send money back home, um, etc. So I think, again, it's just part of making sure that we are constantly viewing it as a system of, of flows, you know, that people will go out, but hopefully money comes back in and that money will come in if it's easier to, um, to take out. And um, I think that's really, you know, underpins, um, you know, so, so much of it. But also it might be interesting to think that we also can't predict what a truly, you know, I don't know if you could have predicted um, in the Middle Ages what um, a largely liberal democratic world order would look like. And so I must say, I don't, I, I'm, I couldn't say that I know exactly what um, a world of free movement would bring up. I'm sure it would bring up a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities as well. Um, you might also increasingly where the entire world is more like a country. So you have some countries that become far more industrial zones and other kind of some, you know, parts of the world that become places where people live and do more, um, you know, leisurely activities, etc. So I don't know if every single country will remain a destination of work necessarily, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, but I, I, I genuinely think that trying to overly plan everything is not particularly useful. And maybe this is where a little bit of optimism comes in. I think just allowing people to be more free and to pursue opportunity wherever they may find it, um, I think that will work out better than, than trying to, um, you know, trying to, to resist that or to work against it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's hard to argue against more freedom and more fairness in the world as a, as a good objective to work towards one way or another. But I think we've taken up more than enough of your time. Thank you so much. Unless you have any further comments that you want to close off with, anything you, you feel we didn't touch on? 
No, not at all. Um, I think we covered quite a lot of good ground. Um, I mean, I would also just say that, in, you know, I think immigrants in general or people who are likely to, to move to other countries are probably, um, you know, the kinds of people that we want to attract. And so I'm not just talking about coming in, but I'm even talking from the perspective of other countries where that might be receiving South Africans. I think the fear around, and it's not something we did talk about much today, but around culture and values um, is not something to be seriously concerned about. I mean, I don't think democracy or a liberal democratic order is like an end goal. It's something that you continuously have to fight towards and justify. And if you end up letting in people who don't share those values, well, then you have to persuade people anew. You can't just take it for granted that we live in a enlightened world um, that appreciates human rights, etc. And I don't, I don't quite mind the idea that it might be a constant fight to reestablish already won victories or to persuade people to already um, establish positions. I do think it's a continuous um, argument for a free and more liberal world. And I don't mind if we have to keep doing that process over and over again. Yeah, as they say, every generation is just one generation away from tyranny. It's up to every generation to re-establish the values that it wants to live within and without its, its particular nations. But thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That's Gwen Nguena from the DA's Head of Policy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Brian. And hopefully we'll see you soon. Yes, it was a great conversation. Thank you. Thanks very much.